Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstones Online. We are so happy to have you with us this morning, and I'm Pastor Susan, and I'm going to be sharing today's announcements with you. First of all, we are collecting soups and ramen noodles for the Topeka Rescue Mission this month. If you'd like to pick some up while you're shopping or even make a special trip for it, you can drop them by the church and we will make sure they get there with all the rest of our donations. And Monday, February 1st, our church will be helping serve a meal at the mission. If you'd like to help, we need two or three more people, just contact Ruth Ann. Or if you don't have the contact information, just notify Christy in the office and we will connect you. Today, for the first time, our new elder board will be meeting. We ask that you be in prayer for them as they make the decisions concerning our church community. For those of you who don't know, our new elder board members are Rick Anderson, Brian Hart, Kelly McClendon, and Jake Swatowski. I always say that wrong. Sorry, Jake, but <laughs> you all know who I'm talking about. Anyway, please keep them in prayer this entire year and keep their families covered in prayer also. Now, this is a special prayer request coming from Lauren and Melody. They have a daughter, granddaughter who's 20 years old and her name is Arden. Now Arden has a very rare medical condition and tomorrow at 2.30 in, I'm gonna make sure I get this right, yes, Raleigh, North Carolina, she will be having surgery. This surgery is upon her neck, and I guess I'm looking at this. It is, yes, on her neck. And they expect that it will be a long, involved surgery, and it will also be a long recovery time. What we're asking is that we just know God will be in the operating room with them, and that the surgery will go smoothly, and that she will have a swift recovery time and very little time in rehab. And we appreciate you joining in prayer with that. And as we were talking just now about prayer, I would like to now invite all of you to join in prayer with me as we pray for our community and for our needs. Father God, I just thank you that you are truly our loving Father. You care for each and every one of us as your most highly treasured child. No favorites, but loving us all equally. We know that you will be with the surgeons when they are in there operating on Arden, for you are our great physician. We ask that you give the doctors and all the medical team the discernment to make the right decisions. And we ask that your presence there just gives the peace and comfort. May you be with all her family members and her friends at this time. May they be able to reach out to you during this time and put all their trust and their faith that you've got this, God. You've got it. And that we as her family in Christ, we are joining together with them. We are joining together for where two or more are together, it is done, knowing, God, that you have only the best intentions for her and your will will be done in her life during this time. And we agree with that in Jesus' name. We know that there are other needs at this time also in our community that are unspoken and some that have just been asked for us to privately pray over. And God, we are and we know you are faithful. So we join together and we say that God, all these prayer requests, you are in the midst of them. We join together as the family of body in Christ and say we as one come together to uplift you, support you. We come together and we pray that in everything in our church, in our meetings, in our schools, in our workplace, in our families, in our lives. Lord, may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Cornerstone. See, I turned my guitar on. That'll help. There, that's a little better. Build your kingdom here. We'll sing together. says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are God, the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord.
Give us a little instrumental change here. A very talented Jesse Hebert on mandolin. <laughs> he can't play them both at the same time, but he can play both. Of them.
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, hey, church family. Good to see you. Oh, no, I forgot. Give me just one second. There we go. Slightly different view. Forgot to do the one thing that I was supposed to do during that video. Well, hey, church family, glad you're with us. Good to be uh, together with you. Worship team, thank you so much. Jesse, impressive mandolin playing. We, we appreciate your giftings. Uh, we're, we're sad to lose you. It sounds like Tuesday you head back to school. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. Well, safe travels and uh, good luck in the next semester with school. I want to ask if a, uh, if a conversation sounds familiar to you. This was a conversation that was uh, <laughs> had time and time again uh, at my house growing up. Well, where do you want to go for lunch? Cricket. Cricket. Where do you want to go for lunch? Well... You know, now, that, that's back when we could actually gather and, and do lunch easily with large groups of people. God willing, we are on our way towards that time again where it's going to be a little bit easier there. But, but where do you want to go for lunch? And that question inspires such, I, I don't know, I don't even know. It, it seems to keep people uh, quiet. I, I don't know what it is about that question. Uh, and then when somebody finally speaks up, well, I don't want to go there. We went there three weeks ago. Let's go someplace else. Well, where do you want to go? I don't know. And, and when I was younger, when I was uh, in high school and coming out of high school and college, that conversation, the whole conversation just drove me crazy. Uh, I, I, it got to a point where I I actually counted in my head, I would wait 10 seconds, and if no one spoke up, I was going to say it. We were going someplace, and that someplace, someplace was Abuelos. Uh, think, think El Mezcal 3. Glorious Mexican food. Uh, and and I, would, I would wait that 10 seconds, and I would decide we were going to Abuelos. I, I wasn't asking, hey, can we go here? No one else was going to decide, fine, I'll decide for us. And we ate there so often, and, and it felt like, looking back on it, it kind of felt like people in my family, my brother, my sister, my parents, uh, they, they went along with it. They were fine some of the time, but, but so often, looking back, I chose for us. It, it got to the point where... Uh, I, my brother and sister kind of, they knew what was coming. The after church conversation when we as a family went to Sunday lunch together and they knew uh, Ben's going to ask us to go to Abuelos again and, and maybe a little bit short on the ask. And it was probably not my best look, but I wanted, one, I wanted us to make a decision, but two, I wanted things my way. Well, we are in the uh, second week of a series that I am calling Blessed, uh, trying to remove the hashtag part of it. We're, we're looking at the uh, Beatitudes uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're not looking for cheap blessings. We're looking for, for real blessings, not, not the cheap stuff, you know, uh, 
I went to the coffee shop and I ordered a grande, but they didn't have any grande cup sizes left, so they gave me a venti. Yay! Hashtag blessed. No. We're, we are going for better than that, not cheap blessings, real, true blessings. And we want to look at those blessings, but most importantly, we want to take a look at the people that are blessed. I said it last week, but this is something I, I truly believe that many times, and I'm guilty of this too, that many times when we've taught the Beatitudes, uh, I have to wonder if we teach, if we have teach, if we have taught them backwards. We look at the blessing and say, oh, I like that. I want that. All right, what do I have to do to get there? That, that it's this formula. And the Beatitudes are not a formula for getting what we want. If we approach them that way, we lose some of the distinctiveness, some of the boldness that Jesus had when he was saying these things. Because back in the time that Jesus was preaching, uh, there, there was a very clear in and out crowd. There are people that were in, that were popular, that had status, that were considered blessed, and there was a very clear group on the outside, the out crowd that wasn't allowed certain places. If you were unclean, you couldn't go to temple. You couldn't worship at the temple. There, were, there was the in crowd where uh, they were doing life well in their society's eyes. You know, uh, they, they usually uh, were ones that were considered to be blessed with wealth, with a big family, with success in their business dealings. And all of that, the thought was, was confirmation that they were being blessed by God, that they were somehow righteous and all of these blessings were their just reward. But the, the out crowd, the crowd that was not considered blessed, had the, they had the opposite experience. Things hadn't worked so well for them. Uh, whether it's because they, they didn't come from the right family or uh, didn't have a very large, if any, inheritance. Uh, may, maybe they had a business deal that went south and just had a run of bad luck. But all of these things were seen as, uh, as reasons to know they were not blessed, as reasons potentially to, to look on them as somebody who was uh, sinning, to, to keep them on the outside looking in. And what's hard is that so many of those things that might have kept a person on the outs in ancient Palestine society, uh, they're things that might seem kind of petty to us now, that, that might seem really, like, really, that, that's the reason why? Uh, skin disease. You could have a skin disease, eczema or, or vitiligo. I actually have some vitiligo right here uh, on my chest, and that would have potentially put me on the outs. Uh, uh, again, Maybe it was just a, a run of bad luck. Things happened. But all of those things that kept somebody on the outside looking in, it was a sign that they were not blessed and that God was against them. They had surely sinned against God and this was their just punishment. I mean, may, sure, they were born with a disability, but it's their fault Anyways, the blame game in ancient Judaism was alive and well. In today's world, we, we probably don't feel that same way uh, about everyone, but I, I think there's still a hint of it in our world today. Uh, there, there are people in our society that we really consider blessed. Uh, when, when I pull up this photo uh, of, of a pretty fantastic looking beach house. I mean, the, the person who owns that, the, we, our society would call them blessed. And if I showed a picture of a house that was maybe a little run down, uh, foundation cracking, things falling apart, we would, we would maybe think the opposite of that individual. We, we talk about the, the, you know, the bad part of town, whatever that means we have people on the outside looking in.
Jesus saw this at work in his day too. And I think that's what makes his words here in Matthew chapter 5 even more powerful. That, that he saw this system at work where there were people that were in and were considered blessed and there were people that were out and were considered not blessed or that God was somehow against them. And that's what makes his words here in the Beatitudes so much more powerful, both back in his day and in ours now. So I want to invite you, if you want to turn, we're only going to, we're going to be looking at two Beatitudes this morning. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 4 and 5. I'll put them up on the screen for us. Matthew 5 verses 4 and 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. There was this script in ancient Palestine of who was considered blessed and who wasn't. And I think these two Beatitudes help us see how Jesus flipped that script, that he turned things upside down, that he helped us see that people that we might not consider blessed actually are. and that their blessings are coming. So let, let's take a deeper look at this. First, I wanna, I wanna talk about blessed are those who mourn. Uh, th this beatitude, it, it actually starts the beginning of, uh, of more future-oriented beatitudes. Uh, last week, we talked about blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but this one, blessed are those who mourn, for they will, they will be comforted. Uh, it starts this future-looking section of the Beatitudes. That things will be, that, that those who mourn will be comforted. That they're not fully being comforted yet, but they will be. Uh, just frankly, mourning is not a comfortable place for us. Uh, it's not one of those places we, uh, we, we want to be, but just quite frankly, we often find ourselves there. Whether it is the, the death of a friend, uh, we can mourn the loss of a job, uh, even a diagnosis of uh, something scary, something that, uh, that is making us uh, nervous. Those are things that we can mourn. We don't like to mourn, but I, I think there's a little bit of hope for us that are in this beatitude. Uh, this is one of those areas where it's helpful to have in mind this quality of the kingdom of God that we call the already, but not yet. Uh, we, we talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven having already come, that, that the kingdom of God is already here uh, in us, in the church, but it is not yet. It's already here, but it's not yet fully present. It's not how it will be in the end. It is yet to come, but it's here already. It's this complicated paradox. But but I think we can apply that to this beatitude of those who mourn, that those who mourn are already being comforted, but their comfort, they will be comforted even more so. It is not fully realized. It's happening already. Those who mourn are being comforted, but how much more so in the future? In the ancient world, depending on who you are, if you mourned things, whether it was the loss of a loved one or, or uh, uh, loss of your job or something bad happening to you, there was a decent chance that people felt like it was your fault. Well, clearly you sinned and you did something wrong to God, which is why God did that to you. But here, we see that Jesus doesn't play the blame game. That, that Jesus throws that out and doesn't engage with blame for those who mourn. He longs for their comfort. He looks forward to a time when they will be comforted.
In our world, mourning is not something that, uh, well, we don't like to talk about it for one thing, but we definitely don't like to give it uh, a lot of time. You know, you're allowed to cry at a funeral. Uh, maybe if you lost your job, that's a little iffy. Uh, if you get a hard diagnosis, you're allowed uh, a couple of tears in the doctor's office, but then you got to buck up and you got to deal with it. That, that's kind of the attitude that our culture shows. There, there are exceptions, absolute, absolutely, but, but that's kind of the attitude we feel, right? You need to just deal with it and keep going. Uh, I want to encourage us as a church family to not take away someone's time of mourning. Whether it is someone else's time or even for ourselves. Uh, Romans 12 15 says this rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn if you are someone who is mourning right now or or is mourning things that have happened in the past it is okay to mourn it is good it's a healthy thing and I want to just say, if someone in your life is mourning, don't take that time away from them. Be there, walk alongside them, uh, comfort them as best you can. Be part of that already comforting. Don't take the time away from them. Let them mourn, walk alongside them, and be a blessing to them. I think this beatitude's a little easier to get, uh, get our heads around than the other one that we're going to talk about today. When I first started this sermon, uh, when I started preparing it back on Monday, I thought I was going to spend most of my time in blessed are those who mourn. Uh, I thought that was what was going to uh, connect well this week. But throughout the week, I've had conversations with, uh, with quite a few people uh, quite a few of us, whether you are here or you are gathered uh, online across the United States, uh, that, that many of us had uh, another beatitude uh, on our minds. And quite frankly, as the week went on, it, it came to my mind much more as well. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And when we read that, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, we say, who inherits what now? Well, one, why, what is this inheriting the earth? What, what does that mean? And also, can you give me a clue on what meek means? Because I don't know about you, that's not often, uh, that's not just a word I throw around willy-nilly. That's, that is not in my current lingo. Well, according to a quick Google, which being facetious here. Quick Google, as we all know, gives us all the facts on everything. I, I'm joking. Please don't trust everything you read on the internet. But, but a quick Google told me, meek, uh, in our definition in English, means quiet, gentle, easily imposed on, submissive, and the first two, quiet and gentle, that, that sounds fine. That's, that's good. But easily imposed on and submissive, those, those don't sound great to me. Uh, we, we don't think of those as character qualities that we want you know if uh, being easily imposed on no you get you got to fend for yourself a little bit right you you need to fend for yourself fight for yourself if you have to our culture says but here's the thing we have made meekness we have, we have turned it from a virtue into a vice. When, when Jesus talks about meekness, uh, he is not talking about some mamby-pamby, weak-willed person that just gets blown around wherever the winds may take them. Uh, be, 
But at the same time, he's not talking about people that run over other people in order to get what they want either. Uh, the, the NIV application commentary, that's something that I look at occasionally when I'm trying to make some uh, headway and understand a little bit more about what uh, certain passages mean. It, it has this to say about the meek. The meek are those who do not assert themselves over others in order to advance their own causes. They are not people interested in having power over others or, or taking power over others so they can get their way. Meekness does not imply weakness like it's often been made to seem like in our culture here uh, because this same word meek uh, it, it's for one thing it's also translated gentle uh, and that's got some other connotations to it much more positive ones but this same word meek gentle however you translate it is applied to jesus jesus was said to be meek or or gentle and if you think that jesus was weak I don't think you know the, the God-fearing, temple-clearing, Pharisee-jeering Jesus that I do. I don't know why I rhymed there. That, that was something that, when I was preparing this sermon, that just came together, and it just happened, and Caitlin can attest. I, I rhyme like that sometimes, anyways. But Jesus was meek. He was not weak. He wasn't a weak person. He was gentle, but he was not controlling. And when you look at Jesus' life uh, in all of his teachings, he never once forced somebody else to follow him. Never forced somebody to do what he wanted. And it was Jesus. You know, the only person in the entire world who could have done that and it been okay. You know, Jesus, God incarnate, creator of the universe. And Jesus never forced people to do things. Jesus challenged. He invited. He persuaded. But he never forced somebody to do something. And that's actually true even for us today, that Jesus invites us to follow him. We are not forced, but we choose to follow after him today. Meekness in the Beatitudes is not asserting yourself over someone else so that you get your way. Being gentle to people instead. And just quite frankly, I don't know a lot of people in our world that are like that. I don't know that I am like that. but I want to be. I, that, that story I was telling you at the beginning of the sermon where, uh, where I forced my family to go to Abuelo's time after time and occasionally we'd shake it up and go to a pizza place and then the next week it'd be Abuelo's again. That, that story is, was not something made up. I, I wanted my way and so I did what I thought I needed to do to take it. And sure, lunch choices, that's a small, small part of life, but I have to wonder if even that small piece of my life really ended up hurting my family. Brother and sister, mom and dad who didn't get the opportunity to share what they wanted to instead. And that is not the only area in my life where I think I might struggle with this. My guess is I probably need to give my family a holler this week and apologize to them for wanting to get things my way. I, I wasn't being meek or gentle then, but I want to try to be now. We're, we're told the meek will inherit the earth. And, and people, what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is saying is don't force others to go along with you. Don't trample over them, steamroll ahead. Those people that don't do that, 
they will be the ones who inherit the earth. There will be some sort of authority. There will be some sort of inheritance for them, for those whose opinions that maybe some of the rest of us didn't listen to along the way. I think something that the meek know, maybe even instinctively that the rest of us could learn from, is that we can't change people. Uh, sometimes those of us who are assertive, uh, we, we think we can help people, that we can change them if they just exercised like I do, or if they just read the Bible like I do, or if they just did everything like I did, their life will be better because, you know, my life's pretty good. And if they just do things like me, things will turn out well for them too. If they will just change in every single way that I want them to. And people can change. Amen and absolutely. We are in the business as Christians of transformation. Our whole religion is based on the fact that people change, but we can't change people. People can choose to change if they want to, but if you go into a relationship trying to change someone, you're going to find yourself frustrated and you're going to find yourself asserting yourself over them. This is in any relationship, whether it is romantic, whether it's a business partner, co-worker, next-door neighbor that plays his music at 5 a.m. every day, just enjoying himself out there in the garage. But, but if you want that relationship to work, you can't go expecting that person to change. I, I think what, what is incredible about the wisdom in these Beatitudes, and in this one particularly, is that the meek don't force people to change. They accept them, and then when those people choose to change on their own, they accept them and celebrate. And I think if you live meekly, if you live a gentle life, not trying to exert your will over every single person you encounter, if you live that kind of life, I think you're actually going to find that people gravitate towards you. That people are willing to let you into their lives a little bit more. That you can see the change and the transformation that is beginning in your, their lives. And maybe even a little bit in yours too. I do want to say this, if, if you are someone who is meek, first off, thank you for being a blessing and not thinking so highly of yourself that everyone has to do life like you. That is something I am personally being challenged by in this text and I am going to be aspiring to. So first off, thank you. I do want to say... If you are someone who is meek, you don't have to be a doormat. You don't have to be somebody who everyone else always decides for. But thank you for not forcing people to go your way. You are a blessing to all of us. And I personally want to be more like that in my life. With both of these Beatitudes, with those that mourn and those who are meek, Jesus flips the script of what his culture, and quite frankly ours, expects. Jesus helps us see people that we would have thought were on the outside looking in. And Jesus helps us see how they are actually the ones that are showing the kingdom of God clearly. I pray that whether we are in mourning, whether we are meek, or whether we know people that are, that we will be a blessing to each other and to our world. Let's pray together. God Almighty, you are good. I keep saying that because I... I need to say it sometimes. We know you are good. 
We thank you for the wisdom that you have for us. In these beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the weak. Or are the meek, excuse me. We know that they are not weak. We know that the meek are those who don't force others into doing what they want. We recognize that you show us both of these. That in your life on earth as Jesus, that you wept, that you mourned people. We, we know that you didn't force people to go do the things that you wanted them to, even though you had the right. God, we ask and we pray that you would bless those in our congregation, in our community who are in mourning and who are meek. God, help those of us who maybe don't feel connected to either one of those. Help us be a blessing to those people. And God, help convict us. Help us see how we can follow you best. That we might be challenged to become meeker and not weaker. That we can follow after you. God Almighty, challenge us, invite us, change us, transform us. And may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. We ask all of this in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Church family, take care, be blessed, go, and go in peace. See you next week.